Very good. How about you? Good.
السلام عليكم Hello again and welcome uh, by uh, HIPAA. It's very nice to see you and old faces and new faces as well. Uh, we would like uh, also to welcome Brian Smith, uh, Sony Artisan, and this is really a very big pleasure to announce the first lecture here sponsored by Sony. Uh, It's uh, a big pleasure for Sony fans, I think. Uh, we will have uh, the lecture today for three hours as usual, and we will have a 15 minutes break. Uh, please, um, as Brian asked, don't hesitate to ask even during the lecture. It should be uh, fine if you interact also uh, during the uh, session. If you have uh, any question, I will be here. And after the lecture, ladies and gentlemen, as usual, uh, your certificates will be waiting for you outside. Just tell them the uh, code number and you will get it right away. Thank you very much and enjoy your session. Thank you. When, when she said old faces, she's referring to me, not you. So, because I've been doing this a long time. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm delighted to be here to speak at HIPAA. I've heard so many wonderful things about this organization. So thank you for having me here. I'm, tonight, I'm going to take you through a little bit of the journey that I've made. From I started shooting for the local newspaper, doing editorial photography, started shooting for the local newspaper when I was in high school. So we got a lot of years, and I want to take you through some of the things that I learned along that journey that hopefully will help you out as well, either inspire you or give you ideas that you can do on your own. Um, if you want to come back and see any of these images later, almost everything I'm going to show this evening is on my website, briansmith.com. If you want to follow me on Twitter or Instagram, that's at briansmithphoto or more information about what I'm doing on Facebook, Brian Smith Pictures. So all those things, if, if you see something today that you want to refer back to, it's posted. We're also going to have a live stream going out, which I'm assuming you guys can watch later as well. So I started off a long, long time ago. Um, this was actually an image that I did when I was in college in the summers. I went to journalism school, but in the summers I would try to get, I would look for internships that I could work for a wire service or newspaper. And this was a portrait of the manager of the New York Yankees, Billy Martin, at the funeral for the, um, their catcher Thurman Munson, who died in a plane crash. One of the things you do as a news, as a news photographer is cover, cover tragedies like that. So this was really a grab shot. There were hundreds of people all over the place, and I just caught him out of the corner of my eye, lifted the, the camera up, shot exactly one frame, and he disappeared in a crowd. This, this image, two months later, um, I open up the mailbox right as I've started journalism school, and it's in Life magazine. So this was my very first published photograph, and I was hooked. That's a great way to kind of get introduced to it. And um, I'd learned, I learned so much as a result of, result of that shot. A lot of what I did early on as, as my newspaper assignments was you cover everything. You cover news, tragedy happening. But I also like wandering around just looking for interesting visual images, going through like one of the slums. I was in Cincinnati, Ohio, going through one of the slums and just looking for something that visually is interesting. It's sort of, this is the way I think in a way you kind of hone your style. It's like you go out and shoot the images from your heart. And I shot lots of patterns. I tried to capture some humor. This is the trombonist of the Miami Sound Machine. And look where he decided to warm up. Um, I also was really drawn to people who I like to refer to who refuse to grow old. So I photographed a lot of people, like this 80-year-old parachutist, um, and tried to capture them in a way that brought out their personality. Photographing news in, in Haiti for the Miami Herald. This was actually 
my first week on the job at the Miami Herald. In fact, they had me start one week early because um, word came out that Jean-Claude Duvalier had fled the country, but he had actually, that was premature, so I, got, I went down for the last week he was in power, and this is the morning after he actually did leave the country. The best piece of advice I was ever given when I was starting out, and I want to share with you, was I had shot all these, these news images and sports images, and I showed those to a photo editor at one of the larger newspapers in my state, trying to get one of these summer internships. And he kind of shook his head and said, well, I, I see you can shoot sports, and you're okay with news, but what's really important if you want to be a photographer is to interact with people and capture their personality. He said, forget about all this stuff you showed me. Go out and do portraits of 50 strangers in a way that it reveals something about their personality. And that was by far the best piece of advice I was ever given and something that really shaped the way that I work and something I continue to do to this day. When we're, on, when we're traveling on vacation, this is, this is uh, Kathmandu, Nepal. Really, really beautiful place with all these historic temples, yet I'm still drawn as a portrait photographer to great faces. So these are a couple of the, the holy men. And when I'm doing portraits, it's I don't want to shoot the same thing every time. I want to find a way that reveals something about that particular person. So you notice like some of the portraits, as we'll go through, have a lot of space around the subject that shows the environment and reveals who they are. And then other times, I'll come in and shoot a very tight portrait that's really about the, the person. My absolute favorite lens for portraits for that reason is, is not a typical portrait lens of 85 millimeter, 100, 135. I love working with a 24 to 70. My workhorse lens right now, if, if you said you can only work with one, one lens, what would it be? I would, I would select the Sony 24-70 2.8 G Master for the simple reason that at 24 millimeters, I can do a portrait like this that has a lot of space around the subject. I'm not going to shoot with 24 millimeters and fill the frame with a face, but it's perfect for shooting a person and capturing the environment around them. And at 70 millimeters, to me, it's that nice, tight, intimate portrait. Instead of standing way back and, and having to shout to the person what you want, it's we can just come right up here, and I can do a portrait of him where we just talk side by side and turn your face just a little bit right there. That's perfect, just that smile, like that. You can have a quiet conversation. So that combination is perfect. Also, walking around, you'll see a lot of pictures that I direct that I've directed in the portraits I've done. I think a really beneficial thing to do when you're going out and shooting on your own is to get out of your comfort zone. So if you're always directing pictures and working with light like I am, go out and challenge yourself to shoot available light and just look for spontaneous moments. On the other hand, if you're always doing street photography, sometimes you can go out and challenge yourself to go out and create portraits that you direct. Just get out of that comfort zone. And the, the great thing, too, in terms of walking around is just interacting with, with people and having some fun. So continue to do this. This is a trip to Rajasthan. And I wanted to do these portraits of all these beautiful faces of, in um, uh, Jodhpur, India. And Jodhpur is known as the Blue City. Um, and there are all these great photographs of the Blue City from photographers like Steve McCurry of National Geographic. And I had these images in my head that, and I suddenly realized, like, they've been done. So I challenged myself when I went to Jodhpur to do the least blue images that have ever been taken of the blue, image, of the blue city. I decided instead to go with the sepia look. So these images, I wanted them to feel like large plate cameras. This was actually you know, just shot with the Sony mirrorless camera. 
and a, and a Voigtlander 50 millimeter 1.1 lens. The great thing with mirrorless cameras is you can mount almost any lens that's, that's ever been made. It's not just Sony E-mount because the cameras are so thin. You know, I've had people come up to me and they, they've inherited their father's 75 year old lens and there is there any way that I can shoot with this? And it's like, I'll research it and it's like, you know what, somebody made an adapter for it. So here's an instance shooting wide open, just capturing these beautiful faces and pre-visualizing that I want them to look like large format photographs. So I'm not setting up a backdrop. This is just a white wall behind this gentleman and this is an open doorway that let, that suddenly in the shade behind him becomes black. So creating a look as though I, I put a lot of effort and energy into it and all of my effort and energy is really just connecting with that person. We, we smile, I ask to take their picture, we shoot a few frames and this is what we do. The same sort of thing on a trip to Espirito Santo in Vanuatu. That's the island where James Mishner wrote Tales of the South Pacific. It's an island in the South Pacific that's really hasn't been changed over the years. It's very much the way it was back, back in World War II and, and before that. And I was just driving around and for that day I challenged myself, actually for this trip, to try to shoot not just with without using lights, but I tried to challenge myself, let's just shoot with one lens. So I was using, Sony has a fixed frame, full, or a fixed lens, full frame camera, the RX1R, and I just went out with the RX1R with a fixed 35 millimeter lens and did portraits, everything at 35 millimeters. So I had, was driving down the street and I saw the, these people walking with their, their um, uh, firewood on the way on the way home from work and I saw this woman and I just like I had to photograph her so I pulled the car over walked up to her and I said um, I'm here on vacation it, could I possibly take your photograph and she smiled and nodded and she said as long as my husband's here with me so we ended up and it, as you can see it made a much better photograph it's like so pay attention to the people that you photograph because sometimes they'll give you great ideas. So I love the way these two were together. You know, and just walking around. Like you don't normally think of 35 millimeter as a as a portrait lens, but it can reveal some kind of like really nice imagery where I'm just very, very close. This this was very fun because when I was shooting this portrait, he'd never seen a photograph of himself before. That's how remote it is. So I would shoot a few frames and then I would hit replay on the back of my camera and show it to him and he'd actually start to bounce on his toes. He was so excited to see, see his image. And as you see, he's got a really beautiful face. Sometimes it's, um, you know, I like the fact that if I'm not always controlling the light like you're going to see in a moment, it's, it's that challenge of how can I make images in, in available light. These were, these were actually a couple images um, when Sony first came out with the original A7, A7R. Uh, they reached out to me about a week before it was announced and asked if I could do some photographs, if I could shoot some photographs with it. So when the camera was announced they would have some images, there would be some images with the camera. And they, I, I'm sure they thought I was going to shoot in a studio. Instead I took the camera down to Haiti and made these portraits wide open with a 50 millimeter, 55 millimeter 1.8 Zeiss lens. So, you know, e even when I'm not working in a studio, this isn't red seamless behind him. This is just a construction fence that I threw out of focus shooting wide open just to capture this boy's face. And one thing that I'll, I'll do a lot when I'm shooting kids is almost anytime I'm doing a portrait, I want to look the subject right in the eye. He's, he's about this tall and I don't want to shoot down on him like this. So I actually started off on one knee and then ended up doing the whole shoot actually sitting right in front of him. So the two of us are looking eye to eye right here. And we shot for about five minutes. I thought he was really great 
in front of a camera and I wanted to capture, I wanted to capture like the feeling of um, this little boy in Haiti, like possibly with the hope for the future. And when we were done, I smiled at him, reached over and shook his head, and I suddenly heard all this applause beat. And I had no idea, as we were sitting there quietly, all these people had um, started to group behind us. So there were like 200 people very respectfully watching the shoot. So he ended up with applause at the end. So to me, that's a really rewarding thing of to give the spotlight to somebody for the first time in his life, he probably was the, the hero of the day. A great lesson I learned very early in my newspaper career is that you can play it safe and do the predictable photograph that everyone expects or try for something completely new that's, that's unexpected. I was assigned, um, when I was working at um, my second newspaper out of college in Southern California, um, the 1984 Los Angeles Olympics were in town. We had, we received credentials for three photographers to cover the game. So I was one of three photographers covering the, the Olympics for my newspaper. Our competitor, the LA Times, purchased the pool newspaper rights, so they received 28 credentials. So three of us against 28 of them. And I'll tell you what, it's always more fun to be the underdog when you're the three and they're the 28 because all the pressure's on them, and we had a chance to do something completely different. So they would be at the finish line at every race, but instead I would be, I'd be looking for a different camera angle. A lot of the images that I, I took, instead of being in the, the pit with all the photographers who are shooting up into the lights, I actually like, went up into the stands and shot with a really long telephoto lens to get really clean images. Um, for, this, for this picture of the start of the backstroke race, actually the first, first photographs I ever took for a newspaper when I was in high school, I was on the high school swim team. So I would shoot, I would shoot the races um, for the local newspaper. And I learned as I was doing that, that backstroke's one of those things that from poolside, it's not a very good picture. But if you're overhead looking down, you see the faces as they're starting because they're they're all looking up. This photograph was taken in the stadium at the very top row. I was actually standing on the top bleacher, and there was no one within about 10 rows of me. You know, I was so far up, anybody with a camera could have gone up there and done this image. But just because I had a credential down beside the pool, I knew of a better angle that anyone could have shot. So I look for, for shots like this, things of repetitive patterns, just a different way of seeing the games instead of just focusing on the finish line, focusing on the, the patterns and shooting, sometimes shooting this last image really wide and then shooting very, very tight. So this is, this is actually shot with an 800 millimeter lens just to capture the action and the color of the game. And of course you want to capture the, emo the emotion of the games as well. Because like the moment, it's not just the moment of action, but it's reaction as well. So 25 images from, from uh, the games we submitted, and that year we won the Pulitzer Prize for spot news photography for these images just because we didn't play it safe. My boss wasn't the one who came up with the term Swing for the fences. Try for the image that is not predictable. And four years later, that led to the Seoul Olympics with probably my best known sports image. This is Greg Luganis hitting his head on the diving board right there. And this actually illustrates how much technology has changed. Uh, this was back in the day that pre-digital were shooting color negative film, the fastest you could push the film and still make it look, you can see how big the grain is right here. The fastest you could push it and still get away with was ISO 1600. That's like nothing today compared to digital sensors. So 
So shooting at 1600, the motor drives back then, if you were lucky, if you just put in brand new batteries, you might get three and a half frames a second. That's compared to Sony's new A9 camera that shoots 20 frames a second. Three and a half frames a second. And that's actually an instance where that paid off for me. Because today, I think, if everyone's shooting at 20 frames a second, everybody gets this picture. But because everyone's shooting at three and a half frames a second, I'd photographed Greg many times before. And on this particular dive, I'm following up and down. And all of a sudden, I just see him lose form, and he, he goes splat into the water. And I didn't see what happened. And I, I turned around, and I said, what happened? And everybody around me turned at me like I was crazy. And they said, he hit his head. And I realized right at that moment, because I didn't see it, when you're shooting with a DSLR, you never, you never see the moment that you're actually capturing because the mirror's up. But because I didn't see it, I felt, hey, maybe I've got the image. And because they all saw what happened, I thought, maybe they don't. And sure enough, that's the way it turned out. Only a couple of us out of probably 100 photographers covering this event got the moment he hit his head. And then within your career, there's always going to be defining moments that, that move you to the next thing. I've changed course many times, and I keep changing back to things. But one of the things that really changed what I did, as much as I love shooting uh, sports from a distance, I really like those times that I could photograph people one on one. And as a news photographer, you do some of that as well, as well too. So one time that happened where uh, director, I was sent out to photograph director John Houston. And the way those things work is if you're, they all do press junkets where the director and stars sit down with the reporters and, and answer questions in an interview. And it's usually the same thing every 30 minutes. Like a new reporter comes in and asks them the same questions. And the photographer, if the writer likes you, gives you five minutes at the end. If he doesn't really like you, you might get two minutes. And John went in for his interview with the, the reporter. And they said, we'll, we'll be out in uh, 25 minutes. So I'm out in, in his hotel suite. And I'm, I've got the chance to set up lights. So there was a, a white wall kind of like this board. And I just set up you know, my big umbrella to the side and my camera. And I'm ready to go. And he walked out. And he was you know, after his interview. And he's kind of shocked. He's like, what is all this stuff? I thought this was just a picture for the newspaper. And I said, Mr. Houston? There's small pictures, there's big pictures, but this is a John Houston picture, which is the biggest of them all. And he kind of smiled at me and was like, I could see it's sort of like, OK, you got me, kid. I'll do this. So he was very cooperative. We got the shot. But I knew right then and there that if I kept going into these situations as the newspaper photographer, I would always be viewed as the guy who has five minutes to do the portrait. So I knew that I wanted to really make my way into magazines where I'd have more time with the subject. And one of the ways that you move yourself from where you are to where you want to be is to shoot every job that you do, treat every opportunity as though it's your dream assignment. Too many of my colleagues sat around and said, yeah, I can't do that because I'm not working for a magazine. We can't do this. It's like, I didn't care. So right at that point, I treated every assignment I got as though it was a dream assignment. So whether I was photographing Cuban refugees for the Miami Herald or women in the military for Rolling Stone, I tried to come away with a portfolio image of everything that I shot and tried to put that, I put the same amount of energy into it. And I just viewed everything as an opportunity to create a, a great image for my book. So again, you know, whether I'm shooting for, this is 
a musician for Rolling Stone, taking the same approach I am to my newspaper portrait. And as you come up with this plan, you want to follow your dreams and get where you want to go. And this, is a, this was a pivotal time for me. I was shooting, you know, I was shooting musicians for Rolling Stone, but I wasn't really doing any major stars. So I was trying to, I was trying to come up with a way of how can I possibly show people that I can photograph celebrities without actually being assigned to shoot a celebrity. You can't just call up a major Hollywood star and say, I need to shoot some pictures for my portfolio. You know, can we, can we do some shots? It's not going to happen. And one day, I was watching CNN, and an interview came on with an amazing woman. And I was watching this thinking, oh my god, she is amazing. This woman is, is, so, is so interesting. I would love to have that sort of assignment. And after watching her for five minutes, I thought, you know what? I don't have to go through a publicist. I can call her up and arrange to shoot her portrait. And that's what led to an afternoon photographing the amazing Dixie Evans, a burlesque dancer who at the time was in her 60s. And one of the reasons we did this project is both to show what I could do photographing a performer and have that opportunity, but it was also a very important story for me to do because it gave me a chance to put the spotlight back on somebody whose you know, time maybe had really passed. It's like to shine that spotlight and give them another 15 minutes of fame. So, we did this portrait. It was a really wonderful afternoon. She's a, a lovely lady who became a very dear friend to us. And I was thinking at the end of the day, it doesn't get any better than this. I was wrong. Because Dixie, at the end of the day, gave us a big hug and said, you know, thank you so much. I had so much fun. I just, I just wish you could be here when all my friends come. I thought, friends? Tell me more. Turns out that Dixie ran a reunion for her friends, the burlesque dancers. So we went back out again when they had their reunion and did portraits of some of her friends. And we photographed them. We, we treated each as though it was a Vanity Fair article on a celebrity. We wanted to give them their moment of fame. And they had great personalities. Both Dixie and Tempa Storm have really become lifelong friends from, a, from this project. I created a promo that I sent out to editors, and this was my calling card that editors would see this, and not necessarily, you know, they don't have assignments to shoot for less dancers, but they could see the way that I approach this and think of stars. So you might be wondering, who could possibly, what sort of assignment could you possibly get from taking a picture of a burlesque dancer? And folks, here's our United States President, Donald Trump. So the same way that we approached this, people kind of thought, you know, I bet they can have fun photographing Donald Trump. And while while I don't agree with his politics, I have to be honest, he was always a great subject when we photographed him. I don't have to agree, like, agree with somebody's views on things. That's not really my point as a, as a photographer. My point is to capture who they are. And Donald is a big showman. So one great thing when, whenever you're doing a portrait is if you can get to the location early and find your spot. A lot of the images you're going to start to see right now, the, the background is a very important part of the photograph. So this was for New York Magazine. And as it was, they also wanted pictures of his Palm Beach mansion, Mar-a-Lago. So we went in one day early to photograph the mansion. And as we're walking around the mansion, my wife and I work together. She's, the, she's my stylist. and, and 
a makeup artist on my shoots, we walk up and we see, we see the Swan Fountain, and we both sort of laughed and thought, Donald Trump angel wings. It's kind of ironic. But that image doesn't work if he's wearing like a navy blue or a charcoal suit. It only works if it sort of is, has this angelic look where he's in all white. So my wife proceeds to, she'd already picked out all his wardrobe. We were going to pick it up that evening. And she calls up the, the store and says, you know what? Everything I picked, put it all back. And give me every white suit you have in 44 long. The next day, we showed up with nothing but white suits. His assistants and people around him were completely freaked out. They said, well, when did we ever discuss this? I don't think we talked about a white suit. I, you know, we, there was no discussion of this. It's like he might look, he might look like, you know, a, weird in a white suit. That's not right. And it's like, do you want to tell him that? And they, they ran away. They were afraid. They, they didn't want to deal with it. The Donald being the Donald walked in, took a look at my wife, looked at the white suits, and said, huh, you know, I've always wanted to be photographed in a white suit. I think I'll look really good in a white suit, don't you? We said, yes, Mr. Chomp, you will. So got the, put the white suit on, and then he came out and said, well, what shoes should we be wearing? We're like, I think you'd look, you'd look great barefoot. And he looked at us and said, I think I would too. So that's sometimes you imagine somebody who's very difficult to deal with because they have an enormous ego, unless you're a photographer. Because a photo shoot is essentially a celebration of their very favorite thing in the entire universe, themselves. People with big egos are very easy to photograph because they love the attention. He might not be the most, uh, an easy person to get along with, but if you're a photographer, there was not a single image that we did that he would look at and didn't look at it and just go, oh my God, this is the most beautiful looking man I think I've ever seen. I, uh, this is a fantastic picture. He loved everything because he was in it. So that's a great lesson in terms of you know, expectations that people are not always what you expect. We also a lot of times have challenges when shooting on location that you've got to kind of rush to, to capture things at the, the perfect time of day. So this is a portrait of a tennis star, Daniela Huntakova. And on this case, my wife is the stylist. She's picking out all the wardrobe. And I just try to match. I match the clothes with our backgrounds. I go in there early and figure out, like, we're going to shoot here, here, and here. And I looked at this blue swimming pool right here. And I just thought it would look, it would, this dress would look perfect because it would look like almost the color was coming out of the water up her dress. So sometimes we pick our locations just in terms of like how the wardrobe pairs against the background and figure out our order that way. And you always kind of want to shoot for something more. This is a Mexican actor, Diego Luna. And we were shooting portraits of all these people against a white background. So I was doing real straightforward pictures for a magazine. I would do full length. I would do half body, and I would do, shoot tighter images. But the location that I had set up my white background was an old bank um, building. And in this bank building was this wonderful vault door. So after I've done the pictures my client wants against white, because as an assignment photographer, the first thing that you've got to make sure you do is take care of your client's needs. But once you've done that, come away with an image that um, is one that you really love as well. So we've taken the pictures of white. We're really good. I, I tell Diego, I said, hey, that's great. I think we're in good shape. But do you have five minutes to do one more shot? He said, what do you want to do? And I said, 
can you come back here? Let me show you. And I showed him the bank vault and a, a test that we did. And he said, that's really cool. So we shoot for five minutes. This is just taken. The lighting on this is as simple as it gets. I'm just lighting this with one light, a ring flash, right around the lens. It's the circular flash tube that circles the lens. So it's shooting right at the, at the background. And because this is like a stainless steel bank vault, the light's hitting it straight on and it's bouncing right back. So instead of trying to eliminate the, back, the reflections on it, I make the reflection work for me to kind of create this graphic image right here. Same thing that I'm doing right here. This is a, this is a hotel owner and a lot of times if I'm a magazine photographer, I've got to go in and take an image of a property before it's finished. So they're still under construction. It's, it's messy all over the place, but it had this, they had this beautiful bronze door that just this, I think, will make a really interesting picture. So again, he's kind of, the main light is off from this side, but I just want this to reflect back. So a lot of times the simpler background, you don't show everything. You just look for that little vignette of something that makes an interesting portrait, and that's what we did right there. And detail stuff, you're always paying attention to the, the small details on a shoot. There's an old saying in the United States, don't sweat the small stuff. But truthfully, that's, the small stuff is what photographs are, are all about. Those little details that make all the difference in the world. An example of that is this portrait. This was for the cover of Business Week magazine, portrait of Bill Gates back in the 1990s. And it had a cover line There was, I think, something along the line of master of the digital universe. So the magazine wants a star background behind him. And we're kind of, my wife and I are talking this thing through. And at the time, he always wore like a, a button-down shirt and a sweater vest. And she said, if he's wearing that button-down shirt, it's going to look, it's not going to look like Master of the Digital Universe. It's going to look like dorks in space. So she said, had the idea, let's put him in a, in a black turtleneck. Just keep it simple. Let's change the wardrobe. And this is, this was actually, his people told me later when they saw this image, he, they said, this is the first time anyone had taken the time to style Bill Gates. It's like everyone else just treated him like he's got that on, we'll shoot him with what he's got. So we showed up with this black turtleneck. His assistant came down because to make sure we were set up and ready to go, because the world's richest man at the time doesn't just walk down and see if you're ready to go. They want to make sure that everything is all set before he comes down. We showed her the set. We showed her the, the black turtleneck and explained why we wanted, you know, wanted to put him in that. And she said, I'll, I'll try, but I don't think that he'll do it because it's not really the look of a tech guy. But I'll take it. 30 minutes later, right on time, he walks down wearing the black turtleneck. It's perfect, gave us just what we want. On this instance, you know, all I'm really doing with him, because he's got, I shot him for half an hour, and probably in that half hour, he's, he made half a million dollars. But in that half hour, he's got so much on his mind that really a lot of my direction to him is just, you know, Mr. Gates, can I get you to look a little bit to the side? Can you lean forward just a little bit? That looks great. That sort of thing. That's all I'm really doing. And people ask me after the shoot, it's, when you stylize somebody like that, because that's all we really had to do, add the style. A lot of times people ask, do the subjects that you photograph ever adopt the look that you created for them? And actually, in this instance, no. Um, Bill Gates didn't change his look. However, a few months later, his chief rival from Apple, Steve Jobs, dumped his own sweater vest that he'd been wearing in favor of black turtlenecks. And I like to say this photograph is proof that Microsoft 
that, or that Apple actually stole something back from Microsoft. Um, oh, very good question right here. And, and please feel free, if you've got questions, to ask them uh, whenever you want. I'm, I don't want this to be super formal, so just throw it out what you've got. He asked, did we get a model release? And no, when I photograph celebrities, they do not sign model releases because what happens instead, they don't sign the model release anyway, they instead give you a publicity agreement that says this picture can only be used in a certain publication. Uh, this one time and then you can never use it again. In the United States, and this may vary between countries, but in the United States, you have the right to, to publish images for editorial and informative content. That means magazines, newspapers, and books as part of our First Amendment or the freedom of press. Because as you could imagine, you, you know, as a, news, as a news journalist, you couldn't report on people or show pictures if it was completely up to them to agree whether they liked your story or not. So um, I only have rights to, to use this in publications, but because this was the first stylized shoot, um, everyone used these pictures. It was like, a lot of times if I do a, a celebrity shoot, sometimes it, it only appears at one time, but this one got used again and again and again. And I was actually surprised because it's such you know, a definitive look. Everybody recognizes what it's from, but it got used again and again and again. Uh, probably uh, was enough to pay for remodeling our kitchen, so, or paying the overhead for, for a year. It was really good, and the interesting thing is about this was by far the best-selling image that I had, and in fact, my stock agency, it was one of the, this entire shoot was one of their top 10 shoots of the year. Uh, about a year and a half later, he bought my, the stock agency that I shot for uh, and put it into part of um, Corbis. So uh, maybe he liked this better after all, so. Here's a portrait of actor Leslie Nielsen. This was photographed for um, a beer magazine, the very first thing I did for this, this beer magazine. And normally when I'm given a contact number for a celebrity, it, it's usually their agent, their manager, maybe their personal assistant. So I was absolutely shocked when I called the number that I was given and his big booming voice came on the phone. Uh, and I paused for a second. I said, oh, Mr. Nielsen, I'm calling you from Draft Magazine. I'm the photographer who's been assigned to photograph you for the cover. And he said, oh, yes, I was expecting you. Um, we're going to do it on Tuesday, and I'll be wearing my tuxedo. Well, I was all set to go over wardrobe that we're thinking, but, you know, tuxedos kind of work, going to work, because he always kind of reminded me of a bizarro version of James Bond. So we decided to play off of it. But my wife, the stylist, no longer has to get wardrobe for him. So instead what she does, did was go out and just get a martini glass because James Bond, if he drank beer, would never drink it out of a beer glass. He's only rolls with martinis. So we did this. The magazine liked this image so much that, as a result, I did all of their celebrity covers for the next two years just for this small detail. So that's when a great stylist will really, you know, make your shot, is that small attention to the perfect glass makes all that difference. Here's a, this is a portrait of race car driver Jeff Gordon. And we photographed him at a racetrack. A lot of times, I like to have some element that's familiar with you expect a race car driver at a racetrack, but something you don't expect, which is instead of wearing his racing suit, we, we got wardrobe for him and dressed him in, in suits as in different locations. This was the first picture that I did because I also never know 
I, I was supposed to have them from 10 o'clock in the morning to 2 p.m., but I never know if that means I'm going to have four hours with him or four minutes. So I want the first location to really matter. As we were setting up, I noticed that the wind would catch his tie and kind of blow it up in the breeze, and it looked really cool. But I don't want to sit there and have to wait for like, hold on a second, hold on, I think the wind's coming. Ah, there we got it. Oh, you blinked. Ah, hold on, hold on again, here it's coming. Because then all you're doing is you're paying attention to the tie, not the subject. So I asked the, the uh, stylist to pin the tie up. So instead of like pinning it down and everything, this is, the tie is actually pinned right there just the way that it was blowing. So it looks like it's blowing in the breeze, but it's frozen that way. I don't have to pay attention to that at all. I can focus on Jeff. You know, I can pay attention to like his pose and what he's doing. I've got an assistant off to this side with a little checkered flag. Um, I bring, a lot of times I bring props like that. I don't want to be too obvious like having him hold the checkered flag, but if there's just a little bit of it coming in to make it interesting graphically, it helps tell the story. One other thing you should note is I'm, a, I'm about eight inches taller than Jeff, so if I'm shooting from my point, point of view, I'm looking down on him. If you think of all of the great statues that we always see of the heroes and gods, they're always on pedestals. We're always meant to look up at them, um, sort of like Burj Khalifa. It's towering above us. We're always looking up that way toward the heavens. And by doing that, that's a great way to make someone you know, look more godlike. So I'm not shooting him looking down. I'm instead dropping down to a knee, so I shoot up toward him. And that just makes him larger than life. We show him one of the test shots. He has no idea. He's not looking at it going like, oh, okay, the photographer shot down on a knee, so I look taller than life. He's not analyzing it like that. He just looks at it and goes, that's really cool. I, I love that. We're, you know, let's do some more. So we end up getting him for the full four hours just because he liked the way that he looked there and trusted me. The other good thing by shooting at a slightly lower angle, if I was shooting down on him, this would probably come right through his shoulders there. But when I'm shooting down low, the horizon line drops down lower and I end up with more blue sky around the subject. So just that, that point of view where you're looking upward at the subject a little bit makes the composition work that much better. You know, again, coming up with a location that's unexpected. In this instance, you expect a basketball player to be wearing their uniform, but you don't expect the basketball court to be underneath a freeway. This was for ESPN the magazine, and I had a total of an hour um, with this uh, college basketball player to do all the portraits. But rather than shoot him on campus where he's going to be kind of bored and the interest, it's not that interesting, I knew of a basketball court that was 20 minutes from campus that was under this highway overpass. And so I figure it's going to take him 20 minutes to get there, 20 minutes to get back. So we'll, we'll only have 20 minutes to shoot, but it'll be a good 20 minutes. So he gets out there. They love the location so much that they went overtime. So they probably went to 40 minutes. They're like, we can push it a bit. So I got almost all the time, and we shot in an interesting place. So that changing the point of view, again, whether you're changing the wardrobe in a familiar place, or the wardrobe you expect, but a more unusual location, is a good way to create a storytelling image. Here's a portrait of boxing promoter Don King. And Don is also a wonderful photo subject, because like Donald Trump, he loves the attention. So uh, Don showed up with everything you could ask for, his cigar, his bling, 
and something I never expected, which is he brought the coolest prop we've ever had on a photo shoot. He brought world welterweight champion Carlos Mayorga. Most people can't come up with a world champion boxer at the drop of a hat. If anyone can, it's Don King. So we're doing this, this picture, and even though the cameras today will shoot really fast, I was doing this one frame at a time, just trying to get my timing down. And that's, that's a great thing to do if you're, if you're shooting action, is try to capture that, that one decisive moment when it happens, and sure enough, you know, because I'm looking on the, the LCD on the back of my Sony, it's like I started off, I was kind of missing it, and then like I got the rhythm. And it's like every time he went to punch the bag, I'd shoot another frame. This again, that's a simple light of the ring flash, just straight on with him, one light lighting all this stuff up. But I also want to do, you know, sometimes pare things down from, we've got a lot going on in this frame, so what's, what do you think of with Don King? You think of the hair. So I've got this image in mind. It's like we have to do the picture that's really all about the hair. So I set up, this is lit from behind on both sides. So there's a strobe head way behind him at a 45 degree angle from this side and that side. And it's rim lighting his hair so it really glows as well as creating these highlights here. And then he's just built from the front with the, with the ring flash just to open up the skin here. And he knew exactly what I was doing as I was posing him that way and backlighting it. He's like, I know what you want, Brian. I know what you want. And he's like backcombing his hair so the static electricity raises it up even more. And he said, just get me on the cover, Brian. Just get me on the cover. I want to be on the cover. And sure enough, our efforts paid off. He was on the cover of Forbes magazine. And that's actually a really good lesson for those of you who, who want to shoot for business magazines or for those of you who might work for business magazine, is to do something unusual and fresh. Forbes was so happy to get this shoot because they always have portraits of guys in suits. Well, and technically, a tuxedo is a suit. But it's something different. And as soon as the art director saw, saw this image, he's like, I think we got our cover. So it's like looking for that image that's a little bit different and, and kind of changes things up. And, the, and so we've got these ideas. I've described some of those. But one of the keys is you can have all these great ideas, but unless you can convince your subject to do them, it's just the idea that got away. So one of the things that goes hand in hand with coming up with great concepts is finding a way to sell your ideas so the people you want to photograph will agree to do them. And in a time when I had to do this is this, this portrait for Esquire magazine of a gentleman whose nickname was the Amazing Randy. He was. Uh, the Amazing Randy was what's known as a psychic debunker. He was one of those people who, he actually won a genius grant for exposing all these psychic frauds like spoon benders and faith healers, really revealing their tricks. I'd photographed him before. He loved the image. That always makes it that much easier when you photograph somebody who trusts you because they like the picture that you did. But I wanted to do something really cool because I want this to be, uh, this is for Esquire. I want them to use it full page and do something really cool. I knew that he um, was a big fan of Houdini. So I thought, hey, let's, let's do a disappearing act. So we got to the shoot. He, he remembered the picture we did. He said, what do you want to do this time? And I said, I'm going to do a picture and make you disappear. And he looked me straight in the eye and said, I've got to tell you, that may be the stupidest idea I've ever heard in my life. That's the opposite of what I do. I don't, I'm not going to do any of that hokey stuff. Let's just do a portrait. Well, 
I can argue with him, or I can say, you know what, I'm probably not explaining myself properly. Can I show you what I mean? And he agreed. And sometimes that's the key. You know, don't say what you want to do. Show somebody what you want to do. So this is back in the film days. So I said, if you could sit here in this chair, and I said, I'm going to do a portrait of you. And, and I did shot, used one pro photo head with a grid spot to really focus the light right here on his shoulders and face. And then I said, I'm going to ask you to get up very uh, carefully without moving the chair. So he stood up, and on the same sheet of film, I then turned on these spotlights that are lighting the background behind him. So this part that was kind of going into shadow, now we have light bleeding through. And I'm shooting longer so you see the light from the candles there. And I made the second exposure. And then this is, this is on Polaroid, old school. So we wait 60 seconds, and he's kind of staring at me like, I have no idea what this guy's doing. And I pull the Polaroid open and show him this. And he looks down at the Polaroid back at me, kind of quizzically, down at the Polaroid again, and looks back at me, and he smiles, and he says, kid, you're not half as dumb as I thought. I love it. So that's the example of, you know, I showed him what we wanted to do. And the other reason it worked is essentially, yes, I was doing a trick, but I was letting him in on the trick. And everybody loves to see the magician's trick. And part of, part of probably also why, why it worked was I did it in camera. I don't think it would have worked if I said, I'm going to do two images. I'm going to overlay one in Photoshop, and I'm going to change the blending mode to screen, and you're going to disappear. Probably would have said no. But we did the trick in camera, and he saw the idea, and he loved it. Did this portrait of, of the Bee Gees. And I had in the back of my mind that, you know, they, at the time, I think, were the, had the, the most um, record sales of anyone in the, in the world. So I had this idea that they must have, they live fairly close to um, us on Miami Beach. And I had just had this idea, like in one of their homes, there probably is nothing but gold records floor to ceiling. And I told their manager my idea. And he's like, he laughed and he said, yeah, that would be pretty cool if there was, but there's not. And he said, but you know, the guys will do anything you want. So just tell me what you do want to do. And I said, let's do that. Let's do gold records floor to ceiling. And he goes, OK, fine. So we set this up in a studio. My wife and I, she went out and found a, a hundred um, LP records for 50 cents a piece. We spray paint them gold. We build the set, paint it gold. And the guys walk in. And sometimes people ask, it's, have looked at this picture and said, well, you know, you could have just done this in green screen, shot them on green, and created this in post. And yes, you could, except you miss out on that moment that the Bee Gees walk in and laugh hysterically because they're, they realize they're being photographed by a crazy person. So it's that moment of like really having fun with your subject, the way that I said very early in terms of capturing their personality, bringing it out. I, I can't just go, hey, I want you guys to have a lot of fun right now. Have, have some fun. But if I create this, they're laughing, basically laughing at me the whole shoot, but having a lot of fun as a result. Yes. Well, there still there was still was retouching. I think we might have been I think we might have been at Photoshop one, which means like no layers. So you probably could create this with the chance that you better get it right in one time because there's no, you know, taking it back. But retouch you know retouchers of the day. You know, you would send it to, you would have to send it to a retoucher and it would take forever. Um, but yeah, this is, this is probably early in the days that you could, that you could do that.
Um, I don't, I, I think, par again, part of it is like, you know, this way they knew, also, they knew what I was doing. They didn't go like, I wonder if he's really going to put in records or something else. So it's like, you know, that actually gives a little bit of confidence to them in terms of they know what the concept is. They know what the idea is. It isn't, you know, what are we getting ourselves into? So I would say that's part of it as well of, um, you know, they knew exactly what we were doing instead of having to worry. Um, I wonder what that's going to look like. They, they could see what it looked like. This was a portrait of a, a baseball player um, who, the year before I did that, led, led the um, uh, Major League Baseball in home runs. But he also got into a lot of altercations with, with photographers and writers. He was kind of known as the bad boy of baseball, Albert Bell. And this was for a full page opener of, for the uh, spring training uh, for Newsweek magazine. So it's an important picture for my editors. They, you know, we had the discussion. It's like, you know, it's really important that we come up with a good picture, but this could be kind of difficult. So the first thing I did was I called up um, Albert's manager, his sports agent, and I said, hey, I'm the photographer going out to photograph Albert in spring training. I want the shoot to go well. What can you tell me about what he, you know, will and won't do? And his manager was like straightforward. He's like, yeah, this is an important picture for us. We want it to be good too. Um, Albert's actually a really good guy. But the key is he wants you to be straightforward and tell him exactly what you're going to do. And, you know, as, as long as you come up and introduce yourself and don't try to sneak anything, He'll be absolutely fine. So just whatever your idea is, tell him what you want to do, and he's going to be cool with it. So I wanted to do this shot, and, and my whole idea was the, the, the vantage point, because he hit so many home runs, what's the vantage point of the ball coming in as this bat's there? I wanted the, the feeling as though a ball's coming in and it's terrified of his bat. So, he showed up, and I went up, and I said, Mr. Bell, I'm here from Newsweek for your portrait. And he's like, yeah, what, what did you want to do? And I explained that to him, and he goes, how are you going to do that? And I said, can I show you? And he said, sure. So we do this picture, and this is shot with a fisheye lens. And if there's one cardinal rule in photography, it's when you're photographing somebody with a fisheye lens, they could absolutely hate it. So it's like, maybe you better not show them to it. But based on what his agent said, I figured, let me be straightforward. He's either going to like the picture or, you know, I might get hit over the head with the bat. There's not going to be a middle ground. It either works or it doesn't. And I did this picture, and he goes, oh, that's cool. I see what you mean. So he was in on it. And I thought that was really, to me, that was really important, is I didn't want to sneak something. And what I really loved on this was, as we're shooting this, He's, of course, you know, agreed to do our shoot, but a lot of the other photographers who are you know, covering spring training for newspapers or something like that, or the wire services, they're in the background. And um, I kind of like look over in my shoulder, and I see them sort of like inching up like they're going to try to shoot the same shot. He takes the bat up for one second, just goes. And I, and I look back, and they all did this and just scoot it out of there. So it was like he agreed to us because we took the time to introduce ourselves and explain what we wanted to do instead of just sneak up and shoot a picture. And I also, as a, as a magazine photographer, I shoot lots of uh, corporate CEOs and marketing people. And um, this was the vice president of portrait shoot of the vice president of Burger King right here. And it was shot for Ad, Ad Week magazine. So when I'm going over ideas with, with um, uh, his assistant uh, at Burger King, they said, 
oh, actually, the day you want to shoot, we've got, we've got the Burger King in the office. Do you, want to, do you want to photograph them together? And it's like, yeah, of course I want the, the, them and the, him with the Burger King. So I said, oh, you know, it would be perfect. There's a store. You have one of your restaurants two blocks from the office. Could we get, could we get them together there? And she said, well, you could photograph our vice president there, no problem, but the Burger King can't come close to a restaurant or he'll be mobbed. But you can shoot in our cafeteria. I was like, well, yeah, thanks, but I really need it to look like a store. And she said, oh, well, we always redecorate our cafeteria to look like our, our stores every time we make a change. Like, okay, that's good, but I also, I need them eating your food as well. And she said, that's not going to be a problem. That's all we serve in our cafeteria. So there you are. You're the vice president of Burger King, and you get to decide between a Whopper with fries or a fish sandwich every day. What's that? You were angry. Um, I was hungry. Well, no. Actually, not, me not so much. I just want, I want them to have good stuff. So, you know, figuratively, part of the job as a portrait photographer is setting the table for your subjects, just getting them in the right mood, making them feel hungry, and do the shot. But here's a case we literally did that. You know, we get, we get the food right in there, and my only direction I'm not really directing this all the way through. I just said, guys, I want, you guys are best friends and you're having lunch together and I'm just gonna shoot. And as you could see, the Burger King was such a pro, he never lost this smile the entire time. Here's a portrait of director Robert Rodriguez. This is on the set of Desperado down in Acuno, Mexico. And Robert was like, possibly one of the coolest guys I've ever uh, photographed on a film set. Uh, as soon as I got there, he had a break, and you know, normally the, the publicist takes me around and shows me everything. Robert came up and he said, hey, I, you, you're from Premier, I heard you guys are coming, let me show you what we're, we're doing here. And he personally walks me around the set, and it's like, oh, we're shooting over there today, uh, last night we set this car on fire, and he starts walking away, and I'm, I'm fixated, car fire, mm, cool. And he walks back and he goes, I bet that'd make a cool shot, wouldn't it? I'm like, yeah. So that evening at dusk, I, you know, we said, it's like, I want to get you at dusk. So we do this picture, his special effects guys set the, set the car on fire, and I just light him with a big octobank from the side just to create that look. So it's coming up with that idea, and obviously this is a collaboration between uh, myself and him. He, he told me like a scene from the movie and we kind of create this. The weird looking thing that he's, he's got on himself is actually a steady cam rig. And this was one of the things I thought Robert was really cool. He doing this m movie for like the biggest budget he ever had. He did his first film, El Mariachi, for $8,000 using a video camera. Suddenly he gets a second movie and the, the payroll soars all the way up to $2 million. Not much money for a movie today, but c compared to 8,000 bucks, 2 million is a ton of money. But he's still trying to pen pinch every penny and make that 2 million bucks count. So he discovered, you know, what was going to blow his budget was Steadicam operators get paid a lot. But he found out he could attend Steadicam school on a weekend for $1,500. So he went to Steadicam school and he became his own Steadicam operator. So instead of hiring somebody to do that, it's like for 1500 bucks he just did the job. And that's, to me, that's the kind of can-do attitude you want as a photographer. Of You don't want, oh gee, I can't afford to do this. There's no way we've got it in the budget. Just find a way to make it work. And sometimes making it work is, is is to get around the limitations that the scene presents. This was a cover shoot for Sports Illustrated's Halloween issue. They wanted to do a story on the, 
the scariest college football players in America. I photographed Darnell Dockett of the University of um, our Florida State University, and uh, my, my photo editor and I were talking, and we decided, let's do something that looks like Michael Jackson's Thriller. Perfect, great. So he calls up, and it's like, hey, you're all set for Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock. It's like, Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the light in Tallahassee, Florida, is just about like Dubai. Like, it's just blazing light at that time. But I have... Um, the Sports Illustrated stringer in, in uh, Tallahassee, go out and find cemeteries that we can work with. This is the first one he shows, shows me. It's absolutely perfect. I just have to find the, the one big tree in the middle of the cemetery that's, that's putting shade right in this area. So this shot is done at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. He's standing in shade. I'm shooting at the highest speed my camera will sink at. So the, the blue sky in the background goes really dark. I'm changing my white balance to tungsten. So the whole thing gets this super blue tone, which kind of feels like midnight that way. So we've got this blue look. He's lit from this side, this side in the background. We've got a generator and a, and a fog machine. So the fog machine's just kind of putting out this fog. And then one more light behind that, lighting that up to make that glow. So, you know, I had to make this work at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So a lot of real photography is really problem solving. Just like Robert Rodriguez, you don't take no for an answer. You find a way to make it work. Now, the coolest, by far, pitch I've ever given. A lot of these ideas uh, that, that you've seen, like the Burger King having lunch, was my idea. But if a photo editor or art director comes to me with a great idea, I'm never too proud to go, well, no, that's not my idea. I'm not going to do it. I will run with any great idea that comes through. And without a doubt, the best pitch I've ever been given was shooting for a German photo editor who I worked for at Time Magazine who called me up. And I still remember the conversation. He called up and he said, Brian. This is Dietmar. How would you feel about photographing Sir Richard Branson on his private island wearing a spacesuit for a story about Virgin Galactic? And I said, Dietmar, you had me at Branson. Because that's all I have to hear, Richard Branson. All the rest is just gravy. Great idea, but I'm totally in when I hear Branson. He. He fortunately really loves the idea too. He's a really smart guy. He's picturing it in his head. Says immediately he says, absolutely. We had this spacesuit shipped down to his island in the Caribbean from a Hollywood uh, prop house. Uh, it probably was more expensive than I was. So they shipped this down, FedEx in a giant crate. They put it on a boat, get it to his island. We got, again, we got in there the day before, really helpful for scouting. Um, they have somebody show me around the island. I find the locations we want. That night, he and I had dinner together along with a group of other people, but he's sitting across from me. And I'm just making small talk because I, I figured that's the way to break the ice so the next day we can just shoot and we're comfortable. But he jumps right to business at, at you know, after about five minutes, he says, so I understand you've picked a spot. Where do you want to shoot tomorrow? And I said, I looked around. There's a lot of great spots on the island. But I said, I think it would look absolutely incredible if we got you out on the Windsurfer Beach, which was this little beach off the island. Because then we can shoot back, and we've got, we can get the island in the background if we want to. And I think it'd look amazing as the sun came up. And he looked at me and nodded and said, well, the sun comes up at 5.30 in the morning. And I think, oh, what, what an idiot. I just ask a billionaire to get up at 5.30 in the morning. What am I thinking? So I'm all set to sort of backtrack and go, yeah, well, but with, don't worry about it. With light, I can make it look good. And b before I can say that, he said, so I think the two of us should be on the boat at 5 AM. So that's when you've got the photo gods really smiling your way. 
when you've got a billionaire hosting you on his private island, he's willing to put on a spacesuit, get on a boat at 5.30 in the morning, and by the way, this was Christmas Eve morning, a really big day for a Brit. So, coolest guy ever. I wanted to show you a sequence right here, because a lot of what I'm showing you is the, either the image that ran or, or my select, but when you shoot for a magazine, you don't go out and just do that one picture and go, got it, move it on. I have to give my editor a lot of choices. One of the things I'm looking at is I want to shoot all different points of view, just like I showed very early on the tight and the loose image. So here you see it's like a three-quarter shot down to about the knees with space, space around him in case it ends up. As a, as a cover, I've got room for the type up at the top leaving some space to work, but I'm also doing full length images, you know, where this is actually, this is probably that first light coming up. Um, and there's Necker Island in the background, like I said, just coming up with like other crops that we can work with. And there was even this spot right here. This is where the boat took off. So the boat that took us out had these red rocks around it that kind of looked like maybe the surface of Mars. So that's my backup location. I'm going to do this as well. And the one thing to absolutely remember is if you're ever on a billionaire's private island and you can get him to photobomb you and your wife for your Christmas card, don't pass up the opportunity. Um, one, one of the... Um, other things to learn, so all this stuff, I'm coming up, coming up with different ideas. One of the other things to remember is you come in with these great ideas, but sometimes something presents itself that you didn't think of that's even better. And that's when it's important to know enough not to mess with a good thing. And an example of that is photographing Jose Canseco. He, he had this uh, pinstripe suit with matching shorts. I, like, I would never come up with that and think somebody would actually do it, but he walks out with this and says, what do you think? And I was like, I think that's perfect. So, you know, he's, he's going to do that. I'm not going to fight it. I'm going to run with that. We did this portrait of, of Shaquille O'Neal in the lobby of the Delano Hotel. And usually when you're photographing a public figure in a public place, celebrity in a public place, it's the, the last thing that you want is people coming up and interrupting your shoot. So for this portrait of uh, Shaquille, we're shooting in the lobby, and I've got, I've got my big six-foot octobank set up on the side, but I want to give him more privacy than that. So we actually set up four of them, one right after the next, and I almost closed off the area, and then we have a a big silk that we run behind them. So it's creating this corridor that really gives him privacy as he walks through. But even so, this guy realized that one of the guests in the hotel heard that Shaq was coming. So he kept kind of walking by nonchalantly to see if Shaq was there yet. And that, can, that sort of thing can be the kiss of death, where suddenly somebody comes up and wants to be photographed with Shaq, and Shaq goes, the shoot's over. Unless the guy dying to be photographed with Shaquille O'Neal is Jamie Foxx, in which case you just shoot the picture. And we shot this, this was in the film era, and we shot, I shot exactly one frame, and I didn't see, it, see this till I processed the film. Jamie's figuring we're doing like this kind of a shot. So right as I got ready to shoot, he went up on his tiptoes to try to stretch as much as he can. And you can see it doesn't really make any difference. It's like you're standing against one of the biggest human beings on the planet. That's all you can do. Um, a lot of people always ask me, like, how did you come up with your personal style? Well, I think sometimes you need to let your style find you. You know, instead of concentrating too much on I'm going to be the guy who shot, shoots things with two lights behind the subject. 
find a way that really the photographs are from your heart. And I, I sort of had to go backwards to come up with an example of this. But somebody asked me that. It's like, so you know, where did you come up? When did you start using humor in your photographs? And it's like, I don't know. Let me look back. And I came across this image that I shot when I was in college for the, for the college newspaper. I was sent out to photograph, photograph a pumpkin patch at Halloween, where you know, that's one of the things like in America, people carve up these pumpkins with jack lantern faces. So they sent me out to do this pumpkin patch. But when I went there, the, the place also sold watermelons. And I see this mother and her son walking around with watermelons that kind of resemble each other. And this is not set up. This is just, you know, how they were. And it was like, I was like, excuse me, could I, I'm here from the Columbia, Missouri. Could I do a portrait of you? And I just had them stand in front of an open, open doorway to a barn. And this is just not a black background. This is just open shade behind them. And I did this portrait. And from that portrait, I learned three things. I learned that real people doing real things are funnier than anything you can make up. I learned I wasn't very good at following directions because these are obviously not pumpkins. But the third thing I learned is that next day when the newspaper came out and this was on page one, I realized sometimes you can break the rules and not do exactly what you were asked to do and come away and be rewarded for it. And the same way in terms of those Olympic images, how those translate into the work that I'm doing today, is a lot of those really were about patterns. And I look at that same sort of thing when I'm arranging people for a lit portrait. So this is a story on triathlon fashion, American umpire school. Again, I'm just looking at the, the shapes. And then this was, this was one of my heroes growing up, Jack LaLanne. He was kind of the first fitness guru in America. And just looking for this way that shows his personality and the graphics play off of it. This, he lived in Morro Bay, California. And there was this beautiful mountain that I want to shoot at dusk rising out of the sea. Blending light here, this is a Spanish singer, Diego um, of, uh, um, I'm sorry, Alejandro Sanz, shooting him at dusk. And here's, here's the Estefan, in a way that tells something about them. So I want to give you guys a, a brief 15-minute break. We're going to do a few more images, but I want you to stretch your, stretch your legs, uh, go get something to drink, and we'll be back here. In 15 minutes, I'm going to show you a few more images, and then we're going to do a live shoot at the end. So what, what time are we right now? We're 7.40. So we'll see you guys back at 8 PM. All right, thank you.
Oh, she's with Sam. Oh, okay. Sam, yeah, she's good. Well, I'll ease you guys back in because I'm sure we've got a few people still making their way back. But um, um, if you're in the, within the sound of my voice, start making your way in. Um, so a lot of the, the images that I, I showed you in the first part were all on location where the background plays a big part in the shot. You notice here's an instance where we're in a studio where you know, it's not so much about the location, it's about the person. Um, I, like to work, I like to work both ways. I still love being out on location where it just adds a, another little element to the image. This is a golfer um, who's, who's known for lining, lining up all of his putts by dropping down kind of like Spider-Man. And that's a very, you know, that's a very familiar pose. <clears throat> He's photographed that way all the time by sports photographers with long telephoto lenses. But when I go to photograph him for, for uh, the cover of Golf Magazine, I can take a different point of view and shoot this with a wide angle lens where I'm up like right next to the hole with a 24 millimeter. So it's kind of, as we were talking earlier, it's that chance to blend the familiar with maybe a slight unfamiliar twist. And it's always really important, like one thing I want you to take away from this, I've shown you a lot of the concepts that came through. It's also really important to, on every shoot, make sure you leave with a picture that you really love. That's probably the biggest difference between being a working photographer and a hobbyist is as a working photographer, I've got to make sure my client is happy and make sure their needs are met. But sometimes the way to do that is to shoot the picture they didn't ask for. An example of that, I was assigned by Sports Illustrated to photograph boxy, boxer Christy Martin. And they had a whole long list of like 16 pictures that they needed shot. And we're going down the checklist, doing everything that's on the list get to the end and realize I've checked everything off this list, but I haven't really done what I consider to be a great photograph. I've, I've just shot for the ingredients for a meal, but I haven't, really, I haven't really made a dish. So I kind of think it's like, well, what, what are we missing here? And I just had this vision in my mind that like, the one thing they didn't ask for that would be really cool is the way boxers, before they go out in the ring, they kind of square off together. So I shot four frames like this at the very end. We've done everything else, and I said, can we do a few more shots? She kind of nods and like, yeah, let's just do it. And I wanted this to feel like it really was in a boxing ring. So I want the lighting to really resemble that. I don't want to come off from the side and have a big softbox lighting her up so it looks like it's a, it's a beauty light. I want, when you think of like in a boxing ring, there's always those lights right over the ring that are coming down. So I feel like it needs to be above. Her face is turned up slightly so it's like nice light on her face. And I'm giving a warm look because even though if you balance you know, tungsten lights, it looks neutral, but the feeling of a, of a warm light should be warm. So we did four sheets of four by five. I put it at the very top of, on top of all my other images. So it's the first thing the photo editor sees. 
A week later, I got a phone call from him, and he said, hey, I want to tell you, congratulations, you got the cover. And he said, and it wasn't even a picture we asked for. So I immediately know one of those four sheets of film pays off with what at the time was my first Sports Illustrated cover. And I can positively guarantee you there's no way any of the other images could have worked for, for a cover. I just didn't, I didn't have anything that was, that was that striking. But that one image I did it, you know, the four sheets I shot at the end for myself paid off with this. Another time this happened, I was photographing, the first time I photographed Dwayne Wade was on the eve of the 2006 NBA Finals. He was, he was sick as a dog with a fever of 104 degrees, and the finals were coming up, but he still agreed to do the shoot. The NBA wanted, wanted this portrait of him because he was sort of like the new face of basketball, and the assignment that I had was far less interesting. It was for People Magazine, and they wanted him surrounded by his sneaker collection. So I'm shooting him in his closet with his sneakers. I'm just thinking, like, that can't be the best thing I can walk away with. So after we were done, I just set up a black background, kind of the width of this screen, in, uh, in his house. And I said, can we do a couple more shots? And he's like, sure, whatever you need. So we do a couple shots, and he kind of raises the eyebrow, gives me the sexy look. And, you know, that already is better than I want. But I had a prop that I was kind of like holding off. It's actually, if you remember the shot of Shaquille O'Neal, we painted a basketball gold. And I just thought, I want to I want to work that in. Now, the tricky thing whenever you're photographing somebody, it's really hard if somebody's not an actor to give them stage direction, like, you know, look like a champion, look like a winner. But I can I hand him this basketball, and he starts holding it in his hands, and he's like, oh, this is so cool, gold basketball. Where'd, wh where'd you get the idea to do this? I like it. And I said, well, it kind of reminds me of the top of the NBA trophy. And as soon as I say that, he's not thinking about doing a photo shoot, he, that he's doing a photo shoot anymore. He's thinking of NBA championship. He's holding this holding this ball, thinking of the championship trophy, exactly two weeks to the day that we did this picture, Miami Heat came back from 3-1 down against the Dallas Mavericks to sweep the last three ga games and win the Heat's first championship with Dwayne Wade pouring in 34 points a game. And I don't want to say it was all me, but maybe just a little bit. So. It's that idea of getting somebody to pre-visualize it and, and feel the way you want them to. Always take a camera with you. This is uh, a surreal moment. I was invited to attend the White House Correspondents' Dinner um, under Barack Obama, thank you. The White House Correspondents' Dinner, and I'm backstage and I see Tracy Morgan at the New Yorker suite, and it's like, you know, this is a backdrop of their current issue of the magazine, and I just decided President Tracy Morgan. And this is just a little point-and-shoot Sony camera that I had in my pocket. But, you know, I, I'm not going to walk around with a big camera, but i got to do this picture. So always make sure you got a camera with you. And the last stuff I want to show, I mentioned earlier ways you kind of, you know, move yourself along to the next thing, you know, redirect yourself. A great way to do that is to find a personal project. Earlier, I showed you those images of um, the burlesque dancers in their 60s and 70s shot out in the California desert that helped establish my career. About 10 years later, my wife and I um, are, are looking on the internet, and we discovered that that same reunion has now moved to Las Vegas. And we decided to head out there. Um, Dixie's still around. She still remembers us. We asked if we, can, if we can shoot backstage, and they said, anything you want. Dixie says, do whatever, whatever you need. We'll make it happen. So we set up a, a small backdrop backstage, and we photographed the performers either 
you know, either right before they go, come, go out for their act or right when they come off. And what this taught me is we did all of these portraits in about th three to four minutes. Shot really fast. I shot with one lens. This is that 24 to 70 uh, Sony lens. I, I can't back up any more than that at 70 millimeters. To, if I do full frame, it just fits at 24. The lighting is, it can only be in one place. So I'm no longer really paying attention to anything technical. I just have three minutes to capture their personalities. So this group is coming out. I, you know, everybody who comes through is, is different, and I want to show who they are and just, you know, have some fun backstage. And this gives me a lot of confidence because we're shooting really quickly, but coming away with images that say who they, who the people, performers are. This was our, this was our set. Just in case you think it's like, it's always big studios. This really is backstage at a, at a burlesque performance where here's my octobank off from the side. There, I couldn't move the thing around. There basically is one way people get through. In fact, we had to open up the middle of our backdrop every time somebody came out of this dressing room. You just make it work. And that gave me a lot of confidence where uh, about a, you know, six months later, uh, the woman who runs the Sony Artisan program called me up and asked how I would feel about photographing Hollywood stars for a book to celebrate arts in the United States and the importance of arts funding, much like you have here at HIPAA, su government supporting the arts. It's fortunate your government is behind photography. It's a bigger sell for us in the United States. So we want to use these stars to advocate for the reason for funding the arts. Here's Anne Hathaway backstage. Um, you know, we shot, our very first set is almost like the burlesque shoot. We were in a 9 by 12 foot or a 3 by 4 meter maid's room. Tiny room, but it had a nice intimate feel. So for this portrait of Anne Hathaway, we, we sort of recreated that in a big studio. And here were the pictures. It was a portrait of the star, and then either before I photographed them or when we were done, they wrote in a notebook in their, their own handwriting what the arts mean to them. And this is one of the greatest projects I've ever worked on because a lot of times if you're shooting celebrities, it's kind of all about, uh, it's, it's all about you know, what their publicist asked them to do or the studio wants. But in this case, it really was a heartfelt messages about what the arts means to them. And everybody was different. It was just a complete, it was a great feeling as we went through. A lot of the stars would help recruit other people to the project. Here's Sam Jackson at the Sundance Film Festival. And the combination, to me, the combination of the, their words and my photograph is stronger than either on its own. It's that pairing. It's like, it's also the smartest book I've ever done. It's, it's my first book. And it's like, I get people like, Anne Hathaway and Sam Jackson to write it for me. So it's everything ran like this, kind of the ideas together. You can see that Spike Lee even created the look of the page for us. The, he even was such the director that as we're doing this portrait, he kept going, oh, just right here, this is the shot, right, right here, this is the shot. Well, you know, sorry, there were two directors on this set and I got, I got final cut right here because there's no way I'm leaving off this New York Yankees on his blazer and his, uh, his medallions here. But I did use the page exactly the way that he had. This was one of my very favorites, Zoe Deschanel, who explained the arts as a flow chart for people who think with the, the non-artistic side of their brain. She actually designed this flow chart explaining how the arts work with things like problem solving, creative thinking, leads to better careers. Thought that was the perfect solution. So everyone was different for the portraits. Sometimes I would even, you know, lay out the page where you had that same sort of feeling of, of space around the person. This is Adrian Brody. He did this one shot and we showed it and it's like, 
I, I showed him, I was like, that's great. We did that image, it's like, that's the shot. Uh, his, he, he was the one instance where his publicist hadn't agreed to the shoot, and she said, we need, we need approval on it. And, he's, and I said, well, he actually picked out his image, and it's like, we still need approval, so we, we, we sent them this stuff, and it's like, okay, yeah, we love it, that's great. We also photographed like some of the up and coming, like, yeah, you wanna shoot the big major stars, but the arts isn't just about the established talent, it's the people who are the next generation. And some of them were really great in front of the, in front of the camera, so in this instance, rather than picking just one image, it's like the page was made up of this nine image grid of who the person is, uh, and showed just another, you know, another part of the face of the arts. Uh, this is uh, uh, Aaron Paul from Breaking Bad. And, you know, sometimes it's just like a pose that they're doing. I'm not really directing people through these things, but that gives me the idea in terms of the layout. I'm going to have the text facing that, and almost like he's looking up at his words. And as I'm doing these, I shot, I shot this, in pro, this entire project with, I had two Sony bodies, one, one with the 24 to 70 for portraits like this of Kim Kardashian, and I had a second, second body with an 85-1-4. So it's just, rather than changing lenses, if somebody came in and it's like, that's a headshot, it's right there, switch to the 85. For everything else, I'm shooting with the 24 to 70, I just want them really accessible so I can grab them and shoot. And that gives me the chance, just like the burlesque portraits, I can shoot really quickly and I'm not worried about like, oh, I gotta move the light. It's all about that interaction with the subject and letting them do what they want and capture really their personality. It's like, I don't, a lot of times, I really don't come up to people and say, I need you to smile. It's like, we'll tell, we'll tell some jokes and have some fun and capture who they are. This is uh, uh, Tashina Arnold and Taraji P. Henson. You know, again, it's like those little spontaneous moments coming up with the images that you want. And sometimes it's the people that you photograph help sell the next images that you're gonna do. So David Hyde Pierce, was one of the first people that I photographed on the, the original three days. It was supposed to be a three-day project, and I just kept shooting and shooting and shooting. So David Hyde Pierce was one of the first people that I photographed. And a friend of mine, we were about a, a year into the project. I'd shot, you know, about 12 days at that point. A friend of mine says, hey, I'm, I'm shooting Kelsey Grammer. Would he be good for your book? I was like, oh, yeah, absolutely. So we... We took a chance, we flew up to New York, nothing set up with Kelsey. He's like, you know, I can't mess up our shoot, but I think if, if you guys show up, he'll do it. So uh, my wife and I flew up to New York. Uh, we were both on set. She actually did his grooming, got him ready for the shoot. Uh, my friend does the interview and then he says, um, why don't you come over and, and meet my friend Brian? He's doing a project that you'd be interested in. So at this point, We've got a bunch of these images, including the picture of David and what he wrote. So I'm showing Kelsey the way the book's laid out. He's like, yeah, no, it sounds great. I love David. I'll, yeah, I'll do this. So, so we shot nine images. I told you I was used to shooting fast. I'm shooting nine images. I'm just starting to warm up. They kind of look like Kelsey Grammer, but none of them are particularly great. And he turns and says, well, certainly you must have it by now. And he starts to walk away. And now I can be nice and go, yeah, okay, thank you. Um, it's really bad, but thank you. Or I just, you know, I'm usually really respectful, but I knew I didn't have a good picture. So rather than being the nice guy who doesn't get the picture, I was the jerk who went, yeah, I suppose we've got it, but to be honest, David Hyde Pierce was much better. And this is frame number 10 of a very sheepish Kelly. Kelsey Grammer, who realizes he's been upstaged by his Frasier co-star, David Hyde Pierce. So remember, peer pressure can work for you. And you want your subjects to have so much fun that they pull other people into the project. 
Uh, that's Richard Schiff over there. He's been in a, in a movie or a television show with almost everyone in Hollywood. He was having so much fun, he would pose with the other stars when they were done. He was having so much fun and he said, well, do you, do you mind I was golfing with somebody today who really should be in the book? Do you, can I give him a call? It's like, absolutely, man, call. I love it. Call him up. And 15 minutes later, Peter Gallagher shows up. That's what you want. Whatever you're doing, you want your subjects to have so much fun, they recruit people for you. And, you know, what I was talking about earlier, one of, one of his buddies was, was Dulé Hill. They were in West Wing together. And these, and this is an example, the earlier stuff, just like Kelsey Grammer, we're doing these pictures of Dulé. They, you know, they, they kind of look, they look like him. They're perfectly fine. They're not that interesting. It's like, yeah, we're okay. And I'll, I'll do research on the people that I do, not to know every film they're in, because they're kind of, they're bored if you ask them about their films. But I'm looking for the thing that I, that shocks me that I never expected. And what shocked me with, with Dulé is it turns out he loves to tap dance. I had no idea. So we've done these pictures. He kind of looks at me and he goes, yeah, is there anything else? And it's like, yeah, you got to tell me about tap dancing. And he proceeds to tell me that when he was growing up, Gregory Hines was his idol. He looked to Gregory Hines and wanted to be just like him. They became, they became friends. And he said the greatest honor he was ever had in his life was when Gregory passed away, Gregory's widow asked Dulé to dance at the, at the funeral. And as he's telling me this, he's he getting kind of emotional. He goes, you want to see? Your answer is always, yes, please. So he proceeds to start tap dancing on carpet like this, which in sneakers has to be a hard thing to do. But every single one of these pictures is far better than those first two I showed you, right? But it doesn't stop there. So I know any of this stuff could work good. At this point, he's kind of winded. He's like, wow, all right, that was great. But then he gets a second wind. So now he starts sort of improvising. He's not thinking about photo shoots and poses you do on photo shoots. He's thinking about like his earlier inspiration. And we start to get this. And here's, that's the shot we picked. And a lot of times people look at the pictures and like, how on earth did you get him to do that? What do you, what do you say to somebody to do? And I said, I ask him about tap dancing. And they're like, oh yeah, fine, don't tell me. Go ahead. You know, but it's like, yeah, I ask him about tap dancing and it led to this. There is not a single phrase that you can ask people to get them to open up. It's all about finding that connection between you and him. And in this case, our connection is when I ask him about something he was very passionate about. And for me, like his idol was Gregory Hines, my idol, Elliot Erwitt. The very first book I ever got on photography was Elliot's work. And he inspired me and continues to this day. So I wanted Elliot to be part of this book as well. So we did, we did a portrait. Actually, when I was photographing Matthew Modine, I had Elliot come by. And I, it was the one instance where I, you know, I knew I could do better. So I looked at the images like, yeah, we can do it, but I wasn't really that happy. So the next time I was up in New York, uh, I reached out to Elliot through a mutual friend, and I said, you know, could we shoot a few more pictures? And he was very happy. He said, as long as you come to, to me, um, come on over on Friday, let's do it. So we went to his studio, set up our, our lighting and our background, and it gave me the chance to get something that really had a connection with him. So we're at his studio, so we've got all the props we want. So I just said, I'd like to get you with a camera. Do you want to, could you grab one of your cameras? And he, he came out five minutes later and he said, I can't decide. So this is his Leica that's done many of his most famous images. But he also brought out, because he knew it was about the arts, he brought out this Speed Graflex camera, 4x5 Speed Graflex, one of the early single lens reflex 4x5s. He brought this out, and this was the image, this was the camera that he used to photograph Mar Marilyn Monroe, Clark Gable, and the cast of The Misfits. So, little Hollywood history right there, and it's like, you know, can't decide? You know what, Elliot, let's use both. So we did this picture. Elliot's actually the only person in the book who I let pick out their photograph. 
partly because it's not I don't want to be respective, respectful, but I know a lot of people, they're going to pick out the safe picture. And we'll, we'd end up with a book full of like boring headshots. I, wanna, I want the pictures to play off of each other, but Elliot actually came down while I was editing the book. In a lot of the cases, you know, some images like the picture of, of Anne Hathaway or Traji uh, P. Henson, there was like that one image I knew, this is our shot. Other, other people I had like five or six small work prints to pick from. That was the case with Elliot. There were a lot that I liked. But he came by and picked up this picture and he says, I want this one. It's like, who am I going to argue with God? So there's Elliot. And then the only thing that was like, I was looking at it and like, I love that picture too, but something's wrong with it because it was in color. And you always think of his work in black and white. So it's like, I wonder what he'd look like in black and white. So I actually tried to, tried to make this black and white with the contrast of an Elliot Erwitt print. You know, he's all, he's pretty much all analog, but I wanted it to have that same sort of feel. So I created this look, and then I ended up liking that. And in addition to the portrait of Elliot, I've used that many times again. So the same, basically the same look I did with him. This is uh, my, my dear brother, Matthew Jordan Smith. There's a portrait we did. Matthew stopped by our set. You know, when you get a chance, your friends, you're set up with something like that, bring them in. Jump in here. Let's do a shot. We did this portrait of Matthew. Uh, and then this led to other projects where after, after we finished Art and Soul, the book of the celebrity portraits, um, the, I was, um, did another project for the Creative Coalition, this time partnered up with WWE Wrestling, for, where I did this portrait of actor William H. Macy at the Sundance Film Festival for an anti-bullying campaign. And he came into the Sundance, I think the Band-Aid, he had a melanoma re removed from his nose. And he walked in and he said, you probably want me to take this off. And we both looked into each other's eyes and he smiled at the same moment that I did. And he went, wait, it's perfect, isn't it? And it's like, what could be better for anti-bullying than you know, showing up with a Band-Aid on your nose? And this is a case where like, all that other stuff I was creating, like all these concepts and stuff, sometimes all you just need is a great face. Sometimes that says it all. Uh, actors Oliver Platt and Rick Yoon, you know, I don't, I don't really have to do anything other than capture who they are. So this was a departure from all that, that you know, really conceptual images. It's just like, how do we do something? That's uh, Parvesh Chena from Outsourced. And I like, and also I think in terms of pairing images together, how do they work together? And Parvesh did this thing where for, for a couple frames he just kind of pulled on his face like it was fabric. So this shot of Chris Kattan, I just, I look at these things and just think, yeah, yeah, it's like they're both kind of tugging on something. So I pair those together. Same thing sometimes with gesture, you know, not replicating the same thing, but two things that kind of play off of each other. You know, and one thing that I like about this, you see, just like the art and soul images, all of this stuff is very simple. It's like a consistent background. Just like the burlesque images on the red seamless, it's all the same all the way through. You're not paying attention to what I'm doing in the shot. Hopefully you're paying attention to the people in the photographs. And then as a result of that, um, because I'd, I'd started showing that I could do something other than uh, shooting conceptual stuff, Sony approached me when they were uh, during season one of the X Factor. Uh, Sony is one of the sponsors, and they said, "We've got an opportunity. We need somebody. We need somebody to um, come on the X Factor, and we need two things. We need to give the ten finalists a short photo lesson because they're going to shoot with cameras." And then we, we need you to um, also shoot a portrait of the 10 finalists. But here's, here's the catch. You're not going to have more than three minutes with anybody. Well, I've just shown you these two projects where it's like I practiced doing that for about a year. It's like no problem. You know, cameras are rolling. You know, we got to shoot really fast and capture personality. I've kind of worked that through. That's the idea. You find us this project that leads to a new skill and gives you something else to do. So it's like, I got three minutes and we're still, it's 
great to be able to shoot these people. And then I also decided it's like they were going to shoot with like, you know, really small Sony. This was the first generation of Sony mirrorless, the NEX5, that they were going to shoot with. So it's like, you know what? If that's what they're going to shoot with, that's what I shoot with in real time too. So this stuff is all shot with Sony mirrorless and just really like capturing the personality of the people. I got 10 people to shoot. I want each of them to kind of stand up on their own and show the personality of who's in front of the lens. So on my website, you can, you can find some of the books um, and see my work. But um, I, beyond that, I first I want to thank HIPAA and the wonderful people for bringing me out along with Sony MEA. Thank you. Um, which hopefully, um, if you guys are not familiar with the, the, the great folks at um, Sony Middle East, you'll you get a chance to see them. They run, they do a lot of um, workshops and, and opportunities to, to learn new things about photography. So we're, we're now going to open this up to uh, questions and answers. And then as, as I, af after I've answered your questions, we're going to do a live shoot with a, with a lovely model. So if you guys want to bring the, the house lights up and we'll, we'll um, um, take, I want to take some of your questions now and then we're going to do a shoot. Yes. Are any of my photos edited? Um, almost all of them are, are edited. Like at the second you start, to begin with, the second you start picking which image you're placing, you know, you're, you're making a decision based on this is the expression that I want. So you're injecting some of yourself. If you're talking in terms of retouch, my philosophy with retouch, I do all my own retouch. I don't send it out to somebody else, to me. That's a part of the process. So I do the retouch. My personal philosophy is I want the person to look real. I want them to look their best, but I want them to be believable. I think the second someone looks like they've had plastic surgery, you've gone way too far. I liken good retouching to the best vacation of your life. If the person ends up looking rested, but nobody looks at them and goes, wow, they had a lot of work done, that's great. The second somebody looks at the work and goes, wow, this guy's really good at retouching, in my opinion, you're not that good at retouching if somebody looks at it and thinks of the retouching as opposed to the person in the image. So yes, I, I do retouch all the images that I do, but I try to do it in a, in a believable way that you don't suddenly go, wow, this person's been completely made over. Yes? Taken with very large uh, light source. Uh -huh. um, what about the shots in uh, streets? Uh, do you actually use a light source for street shots as well? Well, that's a, that's a great question. And that's, that's one of the reasons that I actually love shooting on the street because I don't. It forces me to go, well, what could you do if you didn't have this beautiful light? How can you shoot? Remember all the stuff I showed at the beginning of, of portraits in Nepal and Haiti and stuff? All of those were done available light. It's to take me out of my comfort zone of like, yeah, I know I can put somebody against this wall, throw a big light on them, and the light's really beautiful. You know. What can, I like to challenge myself and go, what if I had to work available light? What if suddenly I didn't have all my toys and bells and whistles and I'm forced to, to go out and, you know, both capture who they are but also pay attention to what the light's doing? So it's kind of a good reminder to me. And also sometimes the available light will be in a way and it's like, wow, that was really beautiful. And I'll pay attention to it and it's like, you know what, we had a, open sky off to this side, kind of high on the subject. They raised their face up and it looked great. I can then replicate that same thing with, it's like open sky means that big bank, but maybe a little bit higher than normal, and just raise your face up a bit. So sometimes the natural light when I'm shooting at it gives me idea of like, 
you know what, I need, to, I need to shake up my lighting a little bit because this looked really beautiful. Have there any other questions before I start to shoot? Yes. Uh, most of your uh, photos, you have dialogue with uh, your, uh, uh, your customers or celebrities. But uh, uh, in, do you have the examples of certain photos uh, without dialogue, without get prepared for this uh, as a portrait? To, to, to do portraits without getting them prepared? Or? Most of photos were well, said five minutes, ten minutes, right. hour, two hours, three hours. Have examples of photos, certain photos, you get these impressions. That, uh, we, I didn't see such photos. Uh, natural one without get prepared? Um, well, to, to, to me, three minutes isn't a lot of preparation. Uh, I mean, um, I'm, I'm not sure how spontaneous you want, but, but pretty much if I've got somebody in for, for three minutes, that's pretty much you're looking for something happen, happening naturally. Um, I would say in terms of if you're saying spontaneous moments, a lot of those laughs and stuff were not, were not directed. I wasn't going, okay, so we're going to go for a laugh. It's, we're just kind of having a conversation, and that happens in the, the midst of it, or you know, somebody makes a gesture that is not prepared, if that makes sense. Did that answer your question, or am I missing it? Almost, because the first photos uh, for in India, you said you even spent the time to get his attention, and you go, but it's a few minutes. Well, okay, so, yeah. so the difference, I, I think I know where you're going right now. The difference, that is I still want to do a portrait. I don't want to do candid street photography where I just happen to go, or click, you know. Sony, Sony's got cameras with a silent shooting mode, and I sometimes hear people go, oh, it's great because I can be on the street and I'll just sneak this picture of somebody. Like, nobody even knows I'm taking pictures. Well, yeah. Silent shooting mode is really cool, particularly if you're on a golf course or something where you can't make any no noise. But I don't want to sneak that and just, you know, oh, I just caught a shot of this guy. He didn't see what I was doing. I would rather, I'd rather engage, engage him, even if it's just our eyes meeting, and I go, can I do this? And we do that. And just that, that moment where then it's a portrait. That's not the same as... You know, if I just come up and sort of go like, click, 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 you know, that's, that's sneaking something. I want there to be some conscious communicate connection between us. It doesn't have to be that I'm directing him, but just that moment that it, you know, we're doing this as a portrait as opposed to I just snuck an image of somebody. Does that? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. Sounds good. good. Any other questions, or shall we stroop? So, oh, wait, is that? No, okay, okay. So I'm gonna, you know what? We're gonna bring out our model. I'm gonna start to shoot. If you think of questions as I'm setting up, feel, feel free to like grab the mic and shout them out. Um, can we raise the screen up right in here? Um, let's bring the screen up, because I'm gonna bring our model out, and we're gonna shoot right in here. Um, of what? Yeah, you can go ahead and you can bring the house lights up too. I'm going to be shooting with, with Profoto Flash over here. So that's not even going to affect the, um, our exposure at all. So let me just turn this guy on right here. Oh, right. So the one key with, with electronic flash, it works much better when you turn the power on. OK, so there we go. So we're on right now. I thought we had it, but OK, so here we go. All right? OK, so yes, we're off right now. Put our clicker down. Um, our lovely model, can I have you right over here? So we're gonna tra I'm going to treat this sort of like this is my, my set. I love, I love this you know, HIPAA logo right here. So let's, let's get you maybe right about in here. Just kind of lean back. Yeah, and just kind of yeah, shoulders into there, get in there. A lot of times, if I'm if I'm posing somebody, I'm not necessarily gonna like model like I want you to turn like this way. We'll start off with just like 
let's get you against this wall because I want to see what she does, which is, that's really cool. Like, a lot of times I want to see what's natural for somebody. Now, I've got, the deck is kind of stacked for me, right? She's, she's really beautiful. She knows how to pose. What do you do when somebody doesn't know how to pose? I still want to start in terms of what they fall into place with because every now and then I'll run into somebody and they're like, I don't know how to pose for photographs at all. And it's like, don't move. That's perfect. On the other hand, if you've got somebody who's like, you know, okay, what do you need me to do? It's like, just relax. Relax. It's fine. Maybe slip a hand in the, in the pocket, lean back a little bit. And you direct them slightly, but you don't completely start moving somebody around. I'll look at what she does. And it's like, I like the, the hand up at the side. Maybe what we're going to do is we're going to turn you this way toward me just a little bit. So the shoulders, you know, just a small difference. It's like, this is natural for her. And we're going to grab this real quickly right here. I'm just going to bring this across. So this is a little bit, this one is a little bit smaller than the um, Octobank I no normally use. So I'm going to put it in just a little bit closer than I normally do. So a good thing to remember is the softness of a light is really dependent on the size of the light. Okay. So I'm going to turn on the modeling light so you can see. So if you had even like a small softbox or something, if you bring it in really close to a face for a tight headshot, that's really soft light because it's almost the size of the face, taking it in really close. On the other hand, if we had a giant light that's like 12 foot across, if I'm shooting it from a mile away, it might as well be a point source. It's all that relative distance. So we've got this in pretty close right here. It's good. And then also looking right here, can you guys, can you guys see how just even with the modeling light, this is really bright right here? And this is super dark. If you've ever done that in your photographs and you go like, wow, that's so obvious where the light is. Watch, watch what I'm going to do really quickly right here. See this light is aimed perfectly at her, but this is closer than that is. I'm just going to, without moving the base of this at all, I'm just going to turn this very slightly. Can you see what's happening on that wall? Can you see? It's like this hasn't moved at all. The, the placement of the light is exactly the same, but let's just, I'm going to raise it up a little bit so it doesn't block you guys. Okay, so right there, just going from right here where the near side's blown out to ever so slightly just tilting away. I've actually got the light aimed right here. It's not blasting away right on her face. This is called feathering the light. I've just very slightly moved it off this way, and it puts, it puts, actually the brightest part of the light isn't even hitting her. It's right here. But we're getting this nice fall off that suddenly this is getting more of the light right on her face than right there. So a lot of times it's, if I work with first time assistants, they'll come through and they're like, oh, we'll fix the light. It's like, no, it's okay. We mean to aim it away just a little bit. So. I'm now going to try to do what is always a challenge for me, which is two things at once. So I'm going to try to quickly set up this for tethering right here so you can see what I'm doing. So right here, close out a keynote. I'm going to launch Capture One right here. So. So you guys know, Sony's got kind of a cool deal with Capture One software as it loads. Capture One software uh, in, sorry, US dollars, I have to convert. In US dollars is um, about $300 for the full Capture One program. There's a special rate of about a quarter of that price for the specific version Capture One Pro for Sony. You can also get Capture One Express for Sony for the amazing price of absolutely free. So if, you, if you're looking for ways to uh, post-process your raw images, Capture One Express is, the, is a great deal out there. However, the Capture One Pro is, also allows us to tether so that 
as I'm shooting images, um, I can send them straight to, well, okay, so actually didn't mean to do this. It also has layers. That is not what I meant to show you right there. Okay, so let's instead get rid of the, t the shop now tutorial. Didn't mean to do, okay. So I'm gonna try to set this up real quick and we are going to try to shoot in real time here. So we have a nice tether tools cord. Can you help me out? Okay, this is awesome, okay. So we can, we can actually, let's pull this over right here so you've got another port right here. In there. As he gets that ready, I'm gonna grab, I'm gonna shoot today with my, my workhorse camera these days is the new uh, Sony AR, A7R Mark III. Uh, I've, been, I've been using the A7R series since it first came out, and the R3 is the third and latest generation. It's got a USB-C port, which means it's got fast tethering, which frankly the cameras didn't have before. A lot of us complained about it, and Sony was good enough to listen to our complaints, which should allow us to shoot pretty quickly. So I think we're set up. I'm also using um, the Profoto Air TTL trigger right here. Oops, I'm in the wrong storage. My mistake, I was updating firmware earlier today, so let me just change menu. I need to have the connection set to PC remote right here. I'm gonna do that real quickly right here. Connection, PC remote. So now we should be ready to shoot right there. Okay. So now we're plugged in. Let's see if it's finding it. Okay. We're shooting good. Yeah. See, this makes it so much easier having somebody who knows what they're doing instead of me. Okay. So I've got this right here. Uh, let me see which. What channel are we on back here? Can you see? Three. Okay. So I'm going to set the channel on my remote here to channel three. Are we good? I'm, okay. So right in here, Darren. That looks great. Okay. Sorry, you, you have the worst seat in the house. <laughs> Actually, I've got the worst seat in the house. You've got the view of the worst seat in the house. <laughs> oh, excuse, excuse me. All right. So right here, folks. That's good. Let's see right there. Did we come through? It's always that magic. And this is amazing. Look at this, folks. I managed to stand upside down wow. and create this. This, I don't know how this happens, but this happens whenever I'm on a stage. Things that will never happen to you at home are going to go wrong. So I've managed to completely invert her right here. This is through the magic of photography. Oh, there we go. All right. Much better. Okay. So you see right here, we've gotten it pretty even. It's maybe still just a little bit hot right there. So you know what, I'm gonna hand you this, and I'm gonna adjust it again slightly more. So we're just ever so slightly gonna move it off this way. I don't wanna do it so much that it's like we have a hard line, but just a little bit right into there. We're gonna aim this off just a little bit. Okay, here we go again. That looks beautiful. I love that with the hair that you just did right there. Yeah, that's nice, okay. I'm always like right at the edge of tethering. He's looking so nervous right there. He's, he, he knows I'm the kind of person who will like pull this cord right out. He's, he's right. Okay, so here we go. Looking beautiful right there. Good. Okay. A little bit. Again, a quickly inverting the image, sending it upside down for the two of you. Okay, we got a little bit bright, so I'm just gonna bring this down ever so slightly. That's a good thing about this um, Profoto. I've, I'm actually using TTL flash with the Studio Flash. Yes, sir? Yes, it's too bright. It's too bright. You are absolutely right. So as I was just about to say, we're in TTL. I'm going to drop this down just a little bit. About a, what do you say, about a third of a stop? Yep, we're in agreement. OK. I'm going to take this down three-tenths of a stop. Not quite a third, let's see. But yes, you are right. Okay. So right in here, looking good. 
still maybe a touch hot right there. Do this one more time, just a little bit more. It's getting closer. Right in there. Okay. Oh. Okay. Good, right there. Do one more. Beautiful. There. What do you think? Are we and inverting right there? Closer? Looking good? Okay, so one thing I will say in terms of exposure, first off, he's absolutely right. That was hot. I wanted to get that down. But I'm also going to expose on the brighter side, not till it's completely blown out. I want nice open skin tones on her. I don't want a dark face that in Lightroom or Photoshop or Capture One, I have to open it up in pro post. It's actually better if I have a nice, full, open exposure, and if I want it to be darker and moodier, I pull it down. When you start with a dark image and try to lighten it up, you start to get, you know, you start to lose uh, detail and you can start to build up noise, particularly like if you're opening up a stop. There's no reason to do that. You want to expose uh, toward the highlights. It's close to the highlights without blowing it up. Great thing that I know with the Sony sensor, the A7R three sensor is actually 14 and a half stops dynamic range. So even if it looks slightly bright there, I can recover the highlights and I can open up the shadows and it will look just fine. I just want the overall exposure to look pretty good. And so now we're in good shape. So here we go. Now we're ready to go. I've switched it from TTL over to manual, which means as I move around, if this background sort of changes, it doesn't try to adjust for it. So the power right now, I use TTL to kind of get the flash settings, but now I can shoot quickly. So let's see, keep you right in here. Good. Okay. I, I still want, yeah, the face coming straight forward, moving, yeah, moving just a little, step just a little bit this way. All right, no, step forward. Okay. No, no, no. Part of the way in between. Okay, but now turn your body that way just a bit. Right there, but face back. Beautiful. Perfect. Right what she's doing right there. Beautiful. Okay. Here we go. Good. Nice. Just move it right there. Right there. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Perfect. Right there. And again, what I was saying earlier, one reason I like shooting with a 24 by th or a 24 to 70 is rather than shooting with a 200 millimeter lens, where suddenly I'm way back here stepping over people, we're in close enough that we're just having a little conversation and I can I can direct her without shouting at her so we can just move it just this way that's very nice so let's let's see that same thing right in here let's get some eyes here if we can perfect that's fine. good so paying attention to what she's doing but I'm also kind of watching I'm I'm watching this cool logo in there because I don't, I don't want it to fall in at a at a strange area I want her her head to kind of you know, drop in the middle of our very cool logo. Okay, that's good. And, you know, once I've done a few like that, you know, let's come in and shoot a little bit tighter. So I was where I normally am um, for about a half body shot. I just, I just looked down. I wasn't paying any attention to this, and it's about where I expected, around 40, 40 to 45 millimeters. Like, to me... That is the perfect focal length for half body. And I don't, you're going to see, I'm not going to stand right in one place and just zoom in and out. I'll move forward and back. I, I use the zoom lens not, not so much to stand in one place and zoom in and out. I use it as basically a multifocal length lens where I don't have to suddenly change from a 35 to a 50 to a, to a 70 if they made one. They're all here and just let me shoot the way that I want. So I'm going to come in a little bit tighter. 
get the face right about in here. And now I'm going to move you back this way just a touch. Yep. Take one step in this direction right there. Again, I'm kind of watching where the background falls. Good. Uh-huh. Right. Right in there. Beautiful. And now, a cool, unique feature in the Sony cameras, and you know, some things work better for something like the, the silent shooting mode as a portrait photographer is not really something I do a lot because to me, this sort of helps that she hears the click. Silent shooting mode is really cool if you're a photographer who works on a film set or you're in any type of a sensitive situation, whether you're, you know, you can be on a golf course shooting a backswing of a, of a golf course, or say you're at a, an event like a funeral where you don't want to disturb people, silent shooting is great. As a portrait photographer, that's not a huge thing, but the feature that I really do love on this that you may have heard of is eye autofocus. Eye autofocus doesn't refer to like where my eye goes, it actually tracks on the eye of the subject. Uh, Sony cameras have face detection. It's starting back like from, it actually, this is technology that came out of point and shoots. They have face detection, so not only will it track on a face, you can even register a face. Registering the face basically lets you rank the images. You know, say you're out at a playground shooting pictures of your kid. Do you care about tracking the faces of the other kids? No. You want to track your child. So register the child's face. They can be in a group of 50 other kids, and it, you know what? It goes like, I know who you want to track. If you're a wedding photographer, you could, you could yes, absolutely, technology. You were right. If you're a wedding photographer, you get the opportunity to rank the importance of the people that you're photographing. Who, when you're doing a wedding, who is the most important person who should be ranked number one? Right. Absolutely right, the bride. Who's number two? Mother. There you go. He got the answer right there. The bride's mother, absolutely. I was trying to see if somebody got it. Yes, the groom. We know the groom is number three. <laughs> the bride is clearly number one, and he's a distance number three beyond the bride's mother. So the bride, the, the bride's mother, and the groom. The groom still comes in number two up at the podium, but overall, we, we have to put the priorities where they are. That's a really great feature where you're shooting a bride and groom at, at the, you know, at the vows, and it knows like, okay, the the, the um, guy marrying them is important for the ceremony, but not as important as the bride and groom. That's a great, that's a great feature. For me, though, eye autofocus is, is even better because you've got face detection that grabs a face, but isn't it better if you, it will actually focus on an eye? So let me tell you how I, who I, how I do change this camera so it works for me. Because actually, that's the cool thing about the, the cameras. Like a lot of times, people look. It's like there's not that many buttons on the camera. What I'm going to do? What's unique about these cameras is every single button that's on it. You can program it for the way you shoot, and the way that I shoot might be different than the way he wants to shoot or the way he wants to shoot. But I can make it set up for the way that I want to shoot. So by default. The center button on the A7R Mark III controls eye autofocus. That probably works for some people, but for me, I gotta say, if I've got one hand finger of my right hand on the shutter button, having to remember to press with another hand, it's just like I can't walk and chew gum at the same time. I can't do that. However, the the buttons that work for me is I assign the focus hold button. Most of the, the Sony lenses these days that have come out recently, the Sony FE lenses and a lot of, actually a lot of the E-mount lenses in general, have a, have a button on them that's meant for focus hold. Well, to me, you kind of don't need focus hold. It's like, 
if you're trying to focus and hold, you use AFS. But instead, what I love to program this for is I autofocus. So as I was shooting her, I was just pressing with, with one hand, I was pressing this focus hold button on my 24 to 70 G Master. And instead of focusing, having like a flexible point that's moving around and I gotta suddenly like, oh, she moved, I gotta move it there. It's like, I just press this and the focus point is going to her eye. It's actually even smart enough to know I'm shooting from the side. Her eyes are different distances from me, right? It's smart enough to know, oh, I bet you want me to focus on the eye that's closer. If the near eye is in focus and the far eye falls out of focus because you're shallow depth of field, it looks perfectly natural. If the near eye is out of focus and the focus is on the back eye, it just looks out of focus. So this camera technology actually figures, like we're shooting from the side, the eyes are different distances, I, I want the near eye. So let's shoot a few more right like that. Just like you did, that was really beautiful, my dear. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Yep, right there. Perfect, right there. Yeah. Oh, love that with both hands, just like that. Good. And now just, just relax. Uh huh. Love that. That's good. Uh huh. Perfect. That's good. Any like even just kind of touch. Uh huh. Yep. Like that. Beautiful. And every everyone's different. Every every photographer you see is going to direct models different. For for me personally, because this really came. A lot of the people that I photograph are one of two things, either really uncomfortable being photographed or they're super, you know, they're super comfortable like her and they can just go. I don't, I don't want to sit and direct everything that she's doing. I'd rather see what she does naturally. And when something's good, I'd rather say, just like that, let's keep doing that. Let's work that a little bit more. Maybe bring the hand up a little bit. I'm, I'm not... I'm, I'm not creating that moment. I'm just taking a good moment that's happening and trying to advance it. Yes. Okay. Right. Okay. Really great question. I mean, uh, there, there are people who are really natural in front of a camera. And there's others who are like constantly moving and doing stuff like this. Uh, you know, if somebody's, you know, maybe their thing is they're gesturing and doing this all the time or something and I want to direct. What I will do is, first off, I'm not going to make them feel self-conscious about what they're doing. Like, I'm not going to go, no, don't do, don't do that. I may just say, let's go something a little bit more natural. Just do me a favor. Just kind of lean into to the wall. Put your weight in. There you go. Okay. That's nice. I just want to, I want to shoot some shots of you just like that. So just, just relax. And usually that's enough to change, change things around and suddenly they realize, oh, okay. I don't know why, like, it's really cool when I do this every single shot, but this guy's a little bit different. So, you know, I don't want them to, I don't want them to feel like I've rejected what they're doing. I just want to kind of modify, ooh, that's nice, right there. Hold on. There we go. Mm -hmm. Yep. Really lovely. Yeah, just like that. Good. And also sometimes, did you see I just waited a beat to let her collect? You know, she was getting into position. And if I'm just shoot, 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 you know, it's like we get all those in-between moments. Sometimes it's as important to slow down as to shoot fast. This camera, as, as you're going to see in just a second, will shoot 10 frames a second with flash. But that doesn't mean you have to do that all the time. That is the key with technology. Just because it can, and a lot of times it's really handy, it doesn't mean that you've got to, got to do that. So now we are going to use that. It's like I want to show you that it's like 
we're just kind of waiting for those moments, waiting for that. And now we're going we're gonna to do a series where this time I'm going to let you move very quickly. I'm, so I would, would explain to her, we're going to shoot at 10 frames a second. So I want you, just like you were doing that, just kind of go through a sequence for me if you can. So I just want to make sure. I was on single advance mode right there because it's like normally when I shoot with flash. And actually normally when I shoot portraits, most of them that I'm doing is one frame at a time. So I'm going to change this over real quick and we're going to go to change our drive mode from single shooting down to continuous high. Continuous high on this camera is 10 frames a second with the option of either a fully mechanical shutter that works with flash or that silent shooting, like if you're in that, you know, the, the courtroom, funeral sort of thing on a film set where you got to be completely quiet. But the silent shooting mode is like basically a video scan. So you, if you want to shoot with flash, you need the mechanical shutter on. And this still allows me to shoot 10 frames a second. So let's come right in here. Yes. You want to take that? OK. Ready? Let me just get her. Good. So stay kind of right where you are and just, just move. I'm going to do a little burst with you right now. And we'll see. Okay, so ready, and action. Okay, so let's wait one second. Yeah, really fast. Yeah, yeah. So that is a burst. We're capturing all that. I'm gonna drop. I'm gonna drop down the power just a little bit right here because I'm probably right on the edge of that with the light. So I'm gonna drop this down. If you'll hold this for me one second, I'm gonna lower this. Just a touch. Oh, I, see, I was at eight and a half power. Usually, with the the Pro Photo D2 flashes, will um, will allow me to shoot uh, 10 frames a second continuously, but I want to keep the power setting a little lower than I was. So that was my mistake. I should have done that to begin with. That's why we're dropping down. Yeah, recycle. It it will do 10 frames a second, but um, we were almost on full power. I just want to drop it drop it down just a little bit. So. I've opened up a little bit. I'm going to do, as that stuff's coming through, I'm going to do one shot. So you see it's like, I think we're, we're probably under about half of a stop. You know, fully recoverable. I mean, 14 stops dynamic range, we can do it. But I still, like, I want to get it right in camera. So let's try this again. So I'm just going to do one frame right here to begin with. Or I'll do a short burst. Okay, so let's see, right in there, good. OK, so that's better. That, that will keep up right there. I just opened up a little bit. Exposure looks good. And now as you're doing, like, even move faster, like, go through the hair, because we're really fast. You saw how it is. Like, the first time, it's like, we didn't quite get it. OK, it's warming up a little bit. Yeah, yeah, we're getting there. Yeah, we'll love it. OK, so here we go. You can even, like, you can even shake it side to side in a minute. So kind of warm it. OK, so ready. And action. Beautiful, right there. That's cool. You know, that's just like, you know, suddenly that's a new toy that we've got to work with. Ten frames a second. It's like we're making a short little movie right in here. And that's a great thing. If you've got a little burst, somebody's really good in front of a camera, or I have to shoot action. Like a lot of those pictures I shot, showed of athletes, you know, in addition to doing the portrait, the magazine wants me to shoot some action. How cool is it I can do action with flash? Beautiful. And let's do one. Let's do, let's try one more thing. I'm going to come to horizontal to give you more room to work. And I'm going to, I'm going to move over here. I'm going to modify. She was perfect, but I want to modify the way that I'm shooting. So I'm going to come straight on again. Again, pardon the view. Sorry. Sorry. You're a really nice guy. Yeah. No, no. no I, I, Yes. No. Just, just your poor eyes. I'm sorry. Okay. So here we go. Okay. So yeah, right about here. I'll make sure. Yep. Okay. And give me one sec. Let me just get this. Okay. Beautiful. Right in here. And ready and action. Beautiful. That was a lot of frames. 
I've shot as many as like 80 frames with this thing, and you're seeing through. So these are coming through really quickly, they'll, they'll render. Um, one key that I want to tell you, because a lot of times people go, isn't that amazing, and they don't do everything. One thing that will help you is if you were doing bursts like this, I'm shooting both to um, the card as well as transferring images to the computer. That's one of the things that's new with the A7R3. Yes, A7R3, um, along with the USB-C uh, 3.0 connection, is I can shoot both to card and send to computer. Um, but you want to use a fast card. The, the card slot one will take US, uh, UHS uh, two cards, which write much faster. Shoot with a fast card. And also, once your card is almost full, it starts to work just like your laptop. If you've ever had your laptop at like 99% full, like I have right now, it slows down. Same thing. You want to do a long burst like that, you know, keep the card relatively empty. That might just mean it's like you're shooting some bursts. Make, you know, they're all already on the computer. Make sure they're, they're backed up and you've got it. Then clear off the card or grab another card that's pretty empty and you'll be able to shoot like that. I've been able to do sequences like that, 10 frames a second for eight seconds or 80 images. So um, I would like to, um, first off, thank our lovely model and the fantastic <laughs> hair and makeup for us. Thank you so much. You're very, very good. Um, and thank the wonderful people from HIPAA and Sony Middle East um, for bringing me out here tonight and letting me spend an evening with you guys. So uh, thank you guys from the bottom of my heart. Um, and uh, thank you guys for coming out. OK, everyone. Thank you, Brian. That was really very cool. <laughs> uh, we would like to have a, a group photo, if you don't mind. Just come a little bit closer. We will use this slide here. Yeah, absolutely. And we would like also to give you a thank you certificate. Oh, all yeah, right. Thank you. Uh, there is a mobile here. Who lost mobile on reception outside? Would you check? Tim, yeah, check with the reception. Hello. How are you? Fine, fine. Can I take one selfie? Though? Absolutely. Everybody come in closer for him. Hey there, how are you? Oh, sure. Oh, okay, I'll be right there. You're very welcome. Okay, all right. Here, we'll make me look small. That's a, that's a trick. Okay, that's why we're in center. We can take one from Tony. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. One more. Fine. Okay. Okay. Ah, very good. Okay. Here, let's get right between you guys. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. Here we go. Thank you very much. Beautiful. Thank, Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you. Brilliant, mate. Good. Is that I good? have small, small surprise for you. Oh. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, you talk a lot about Elliot. Uh, uh huh. Was they? Yeah. Elliot was the special award winner last year. Oh, okay. And when we asked him to send us a portrait, he sent us yours. Here. Yes, yes. I know that. Yeah, I know those very well. Ah, look at that. 
There we go. Very nice. Oh, thank you so much. I will, I will, I will absolutely treasure that thank with, you. with uh, the work of one of my, my heroes. So thank you. is really proud of your four space program. Yeah. Well, thank you. Here, we'll do this. Okay. Thank you. I really, really appreciate that. Thank you. Okay.